right. Well, so today we have a professional development opportunity and we're really excited to welcome Mary Ott. Mary is with the Healthcare Foundation and is a, non is a nonprofit professional who brings a broad experience in donor cultivation and stewardship. So that conversation of cultivating relationships and bringing people into the conversation. Rosemary had her professional highlight earlier this month. And so we thought it would just be a really nice fit hearing from two professionals in the nonprofit world and what relationship fostering really looks like and how much we can learn from that as professionals as well. So her collaboration and relational style has enabled her to build sustained partnerships with stakeholders, leading to increased funding and support for the organization she has worked for. We obviously are looking forward to learning from you, Mary, and hearing from you. Please, guys, keep your questions and notes, and it's going to be an interactive conversation. That's typically how we do this as part of the Be Better Platform North Bay Professional Network. So, Mary, with Without any further ado, <laughs> I would love to hear from you and, and learn from you today. I'm really looking forward to it. So welcome Thank to the you. network. Thank you, Bianca. And do I have the ability to share my screen? Now you do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much, Bianca, and thank you to the Be Better platform for having me this morning. I'm, I'm thrilled at the opportunity, and there's, you know, such crossover between profit and for-profit and really, you know, working with, with our clients, our customers, um, and so it's a pleasure to be able to share that. Like Bianca said, I really encourage active dialogue. Any questions you have, you know, please feel free to jump right in and I'm happy to answer those or, you know, have a dialogue about anything. So without further ado, as Bianca mentioned, you know, we're kind of going to be discussing trust capital today. And what I really liked about this particular kind of focus on trust capital from Forbes is really how they incorporated stakeholders. And stakeholders are so important for both nonprofit and for-profit. From the nonprofit side of things, you know, stakeholders can include our donors, of course, our board members, volunteers, clients, you know, partner organizations, and staff. And, you know, many times, and I would assume it was similar, you know, in the for-profit arena, but we often look externally. So how we're building trust capital, you know, with our clients and our customers, case our donors. But, you know, trust capital can be just as important internally, building that trust capital with our staff. For us, it's our board members. You know, when we look at kind of those key identifiers of leadership and credibility and integrity and responsibility, you know, we certainly want to build that same type of value within our organization so that our staff, people that we work with are representing those values and those attributes. And so that they're also, you know, projecting that when we working, working with customers and clients. So just a Brief, brief background on the Healthcare Foundation, Northern Sonoma County, for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization. We are celebrating our 20th anniversary this year, and we started as a support mechanism, a fundraising mechanism for the Healdsburg Hospital. So we are located in Healdsburg. However, we do serve the geographic area of Northern Sonoma County, so kind of North Santa Rosa, all the way up to the Mendocino border. And our primary goal and what we do really is as a funding organization. So over the years, we've certainly grown to support other entities like Alliance Medical Center, Alexander Valley Health, and certainly have focused in the areas of health access, mental health, and then early childhood development. However, over the past year during 2020, right in the midst of the pandemic. And currently our board of directors and our leadership are in the process of a strategic planning process. And that's really focused on our new vision, which is eliminating health inequity in Northern Sonoma County. So those strategic priorities are being developed primarily under the areas of health access and mental health and early childhood development really is a focus on the family. So women's health, you know, children, 
and kind of that family focus because all of them are interwoven with health access and mental health. And what we learned throughout the year, and I'm sure through your business dealings, you know, there was a real light shed on disparity among communities of color during the pandemic and still continues and persists. And so, you know, part of our work is ensuring that there's access, physical and mental health, health, excuse me, access to those communities. So over the past year, we've partnered with grassroots organizations and nonprofits in support of equitable health, even food insecurity, continue with vaccine outreach, education. And then the one program that we do have that we actually run ourselves, so most of what we do is funding to organizations who have those core competencies and are working in those areas. The one program we do have is called the Mental Health Talent Pipeline. And that is a program where we support individuals, bilingual, bicultural, mental health professionals that are working toward becoming um, licensed clinicians. And the, the focus is to have them live and work in our area so that there's a wider expanse of mental health professionals for, that are bilingual and bicultural. So some of the areas, the key kind of areas that we've focused on to kind of build that trust capital over the past 20 years is really relies on being a trusted fundraiser in in the area, being a really involved community member and maintaining consistency. And for us, you know, you might for those in the for-profit might consider the brand consistency, but for us, that's really mission alignment. So making sure that our, what the work that we're doing is aligned with our mission. So just kind of looking at maybe some similarities and some differences between the nonprofit and for-profit, you know, there's a lot of overlap, certainly that we see, you know, the nonprofit arena has continues to professionally develop and that promise to deliver is important whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit. So for us, it's really the trust from the donors and ensuring that you know those donations and what they're directed for are used as intended. You know, we sometimes do have things that are restricted. So a donor, you know, works with us and really wants that funding to be directed to a specific program that we're working in or uh, someone that we're supporting. And so we need to honor those intentions and really live up to that promise to deliver, which is very similar to, of course, for profit. And then I touched on a little bit kind of that mission alignment. So very much like brand consistency, you know, our mission is to connect people and resources to promote health and wellness to underserved communities. And so we're constantly using that as a touchstone, just as, you know, the for-profit would utilize brand consistency and making sure that we're aligned with our mission, continuing to honor that mission and work with our donors and work with our community members to keep that always front and center. And then as you all know, you know, trust capital takes a long time to build. So, you know, we have this 20 year history, but it can be very easy to lose if we, you know, move away from being mission aligned or we don't deliver on our promises or donors feel that we, you know, in some way have not lived up to what we've promised to do. So those are consistent across the board between nonprofit and for-profit. But some of the differences that I would point to when we're talking about um, nonprofit is, so our revenue is really almost solely dependent on that trust capital. So it's just absolutely mission critical for us. You know, unlike the opportunity and for profit for maybe having a contract or having a long term agreement, you know, these are relationships that we're building. And so if that trust is not kept, you know, and there's a little bit of, of removal from that, you know, we have that opportunity to lose because donors can choose to move to a, you know, a different putting their gift somewhere else if we're not really focused on that. And then the other thing is, you know, the product service. So, some, you know, a lot of times in nonprofit, 
It may not be self-evident. So, you know, we're not selling a product. We're not necessarily delivering a service even as a foundation because we're a bit removed from the direct service work that the nonprofits do. So it's really important that we work with our partners, work with our nonprofits that we, that we fund and make sure that we're demonstrating the impact of what they're doing to our donors so that the donors can see then what their impact is, what the results are, potentially what those metrics are um, on what they've invested in. Donors are very much like, you know, your customers or your clients. They are very savvy. As I mentioned, you know, the nonprofit industry continues to professionalize and donors too have grown. They really, really want to see the impact of their donation, of their gift. Um, They want to see those results and the decisions that we make here are based on, you know, data-driven metrics that we keep, we continue to build on, and so that we're able to give those results to our donors. Certainly in a personal way, you know, it doesn't necessarily come always in the number form, but ensuring that maybe they're getting those anecdotal stories or they're receiving a call if something significant has happened really helps to continue to build that capital trust with them. They also really expect transparency. There is, you know, several nonprofit watch groups, watchdogs like GuideStar, and they too have helped to inform donors become more savvy so they can determine where they want to, you know, invest, where they feel comfortable investing. And along with these sites, the foundation, along with many other nonprofits, we give access to what are called our 990s and our annual audits that are put on the website. And so, you know, people can go on, they can see the health of the organization, make sure that, you know, that's an area that they want to contribute to and really, you know, expect that transparency. The other thing is communication. I'm sure that you've all found that to be true, that consistent communication. So if there's shifts or if there's changes that we're continually giving that information to our donors in multiple ways. So it could be, you know, a monthly newsletter. It might be our annual report. It could just be our, you know, our branding, but making sure that that communication is always consistent and that donors are brought along with any changes or shifts that are occurring both within the organization, as well as maybe even within philanthropy itself. The other thing is community engagement, making sure that we're visible as a foundation. And we're very fortunate with the fact that many of our board members are local business owners. They also are involved, not just with the foundation, but with other organizations that on other committees, our staff and leadership as well. Our executive director, Kim Bender, who has been here with us since last March, she started right as the pandemic ensued. And she has been so wonderful about getting into the community you know, working with some of the larger healthcare providers in our area, the grassroots providers, and really listening to the community. Things have evolved so quickly over the last year due to the impact of the pandemic, both for for for-profit and nonprofit. And she and the board and our staff really keep their ears to the ground and really continue to stay engaged with our community and with those partner organizations so that we know what's going on. And then the other item that I'd point to is that donors for us can be just tremendous ambassadors as well as trusted advisors, which can also build trust capital. In these cases, as ambassadors, you know, when we're giving consistent communication and we're bringing those donors and supporters along, they serve as ambassadors for us. Um, We're a small organization. We have just four staff members, three on site. And so having those local community members, including our board members, to be ambassadors for us, continue to build that trust capital, and then also be advisors for us. The advi- as an advisor, it's so nice because 
many times they have the real insight as to what the needs are in the community, particularly with our partner organizations. You know, they're, it's shifting very quickly, you know, and so they're able to kind of guide us and give us that insight as to what the really the needs are and how best those funds will help their organization. We definitely, and I'm sure many of you can relate, there were some real lessons that came out of 2020, both for for-profit and nonprofit. And some of just a couple things that I wanted to point to are there's been some shift in philanthropy, particularly around foundations. Foundations have traditionally donated, and this isn't necessarily true for the healthcare foundation, but just I'm talking and speaking in, in generality here, they tend to give toward maybe restricted funding. What I mean by restricted funding is there might be a particular program that organizations, maybe they've applied for a grant and a foundation then gives that funding specific to that program. But what 2020 has taught us is that there is desperate need for, for general operating and to build trusted partnerships with the organizations that foundations are supporting. And the reason that's so important is because as example from last, last year, things you know developed and shifted so quickly and there was such high need that by having those trusted partnerships like the foundation has, we were able to go back to them, say, you know, where are your greatest needs? And we spent um, the past year fundraising for the emergency COVID fund, and we're able to then allocate that funding to general operating so that people could fund it, or I'm just going to, sorry, the trusted partners could really utilize it in the way that was most critical for their organizations. And that really helped to build trust capital with our partners, as well as our donors, because they were then uh, giving their gifts toward a specific purpose, and yet it was also the funding was being utilized more generally and able to support those organizations that may not have been able to make it through 2020. But part of that is really growing our donors. So really educating them, you know, bringing them along in the process because this is a new trend and it's, it's a lot of the documentation that I've read, a lot of what it's moving toward is the hope that this, is, this will stay, that it won't just be a 2020 kind of choice, but that foundations will continue to fund more, make the restrictions less, um, more toward general operating so that the nonprofits can continue to do the work that they need to do. And just in closing, I just wanted to point out just a, a few just items that I have found to be beneficial, you know, as I continue to work with donors and our supporters, although I have now, you know, of course, eclipsed probably 20 plus minutes of your time. What I really value is being an active listener. It's really my comfort to sit back and to listen to the people that I interact with, um, be it supporters, be it donors, people that I work with, being, being an active listener and learning about them, what their you know, interests are, their passions are, been any life changes, really helps to inform me and keep me apprised of kind of where they are in their, in their donor journey. And that also kind of leads right into personalization. I feel that, you know, the more that we can personalize any type of interaction with our clients or our donors is so critical. We learn about that through the process of active listening. And so we're very focused here on uh, the foundation of, um, you know, writing, we write personal notes and we take the time to pick up the phone and make sure that we're connecting with our donors, with our supporters, asking for their, their input and sharing with them good news. You know, if something particularly exciting has happened and a nonprofit has benefited from, you know, their gift, then we make sure that they're aware of that. And certainly authenticity and, you know, 
that comes along with those first two, but I'd really like to point to my fourth bullet, which is mistakes happen. So in each of our daily lives, you know, and as we interact with clients and, and, and donors, things can occur where we don't intentionally mean to have a mistake happen, but it can happen. And so that's really that focus on authenticity. And I think an example that I could share is it's so important for us as a nonprofit to recognize our donors, but there's been times where unfortunately, you know, you do a donor list and maybe you have it on your website and inadvertently a name gets, you know, moved off and, you know, that donor can really be hurt by that, by that happening. And so immediately, you know, engaging that person, picking up the phone, not just apologizing, but also ensuring them that it, you know, it wouldn't happen again and showing and giving them the process maybe that why it wouldn't happen again, because mistakes do happen. So I really focus on that if a mistake has happened, the first thing I'm going to do is engage that individual and make sure that they know that the apology is there and also we won't make that mistake again. And some other last two points are just on, I found that providing resources, even though maybe sometimes we can't be a resource, in my prior positions, I worked a lot with in-kind donations, and that refers to organizations that maybe you're doing, you know, food drives or collecting furniture to be able to donate to individuals who need it. And there's often times that we can't accept things, you know, that maybe a donor would, would want to donate. And so I've always found it beneficial to provide an alternate resource. And I think that too can be a real trust capital builder because typically what happens is they will come back to you. And I had a, a really nice interaction. I talked to a donor one time who was looking for a place to donate some handmade blankets. And we, the organization I worked for, wasn't able to accept those at that time, but I gave her another, another resource and within the month, she actually made a very generous donation to our organization. And I believe it really comes from providing that resource, making sure that that donor was heard. And finally, I would say, you know, just honoring your donors or your clients where they are. So in my case, for, non, for nonprofit, you're not always able, you know, donors maybe aren't at the level that they could grow to. So Maybe, you know, they're unable to give a monetary gift, but they can give their time or they can provide their expertise. And so meeting donors where they are, continuing that relationship, continuing to build and to grow with them, you know, keeping those lines of communication open, being an active listener really helps in the long term of building that trust capital with them and certainly for the organization that you work for. So... I'd love to open it up to questions. I will mention just briefly, we have our Celebrate Our Future coming up on August 28th. It is not a ticketed event. However, we do have sponsorship opportunities. So I will leave it at that.